Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, this morning, we thank you for that wonderful grace that has saved us. Thank you, Father, for just a sufficiency to save. Father, we're here this morning to lift up the name of Jesus, our Savior, to magnify his name. The name is above every other name. Father, thank you for just your great love for us, love manifested in sending your son to uh, be a sin offering for us on Calvary. And Father, thank you that he not only died for us, he rose from the grave, and he's, he is living today. He's seated at your right hand, interceding for us, even as, as we're gathered here this morning. Father, we pray that you would bless our worship. Pray that you would help us to just really focus on why we're here, the reason for being here, and that is to, um, as your people, worship your name and, and um, be unified in our praise of you. Bless this service, we pray, Lord. Just use it for your purposes. And Father, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to those who are joining us by live stream today as well. Uh, we gather here on this March 27th spring day, right? Spring day. Uh, it, it was here for a little while. It was coming back, I understand, but uh, fourth Sunday of Lent. And uh, if you have a bulletin, would you please turn to it? We have several things to mention. We have some upcoming events. And so this coming week, I will be on a, on a prayer retreat and I uh, would like the opportunity to pray for you. So if you have some things you would like me to pray about, you may put that on the connect card that is in the bulletin here. We'll tear that off in a little while. You may include uh, your request there, and I will receive that. I'll take that with me. If you want, you may send me prayer requests by uh, the church, my church email address, and you see it there. It's leadpastor at florencealliance.org. That is the correct one. Uh, I don't know why I, I got confused last week. Uh, that's what it's always been. So uh, anyway, you may send it to that um, to that email address and I will receive your request. I will pray for you this week. I will include intercession as part of my prayer retreat and would be happy to, to lift any matters that you have that you would like me to uh, bring before God our Father. So uh, go ahead and turn those in. I uh, want to mention also the upcoming cleanup morning and that is April 2, so that will be next weekend Saturday next weekend, 8.30 to noon, we are having this cleanup, uh, and so it will be right here at the church, the facilities inside and out. There will be different projects, different tasks that need to be done, and so if you come that day, you, you can find uh, Rick will be in charge of that, but he usually has a list there, probably in the lobby area on a whiteboard or something that, that uh, we will try to tackle that day. It says, useful to bring, rake and shovel, work gloves, footwear and clothes you don't mind getting dirty, and if you are capable, bring good weather with you. So <laughs> that's what it says right here, huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and, and a little enticement, too, I see, Rick. There just might be donuts and coffee, he says. So no, never know, but there, there might be, so... <laughs> Okay, all right, thanks. So yeah, please, please, uh, if you're able to, you have the time, uh, please come out that day and, and help with the cleanup. Uh, then the following week, April 9th, and what did I do with my, here it is. Uh, we are talking about the Easter egg hunt. There are some invitations and door hangers that are also invitations. Uh, that have the, uh, the, the, the date, the time, Saturday, April 9 at 2 p.m. So if you know anyone who with kids, grandkids, ages from, from age three through grade five, uh, please get this into their hands, invite them to come to our Easter egg hunt. And uh, so you can, you can find these on the, the table back there and, and pass them out and invite people. Also, there is a sign-up sheet there about various ways that you may help, including um, 
hiding the eggs earlier on Saturday morning before before the, the kids get there and uh, then, then various things that, that you can do. We do need people to donate filled Easter eggs and um, so that would be with candy or small, small toys in there and we need folks to help with crafts and story time and snacks, uh, both making them and serving them. So there are a lot of different ways that you can help and please check that sign up sheet back there and uh, if you're able to help or if you have questions, talk to Gail about that, please. Okay, and then a note again about Vacation Bible School. The date is important, June 20 through 24. And then there are ways that we need people to help. Um, and so publicity, is that still in there? And, uh, and then... Monday through Friday, okay. Okay, right, that would be Monday, June 20, through Friday, June 24. And, and, and then, of course, somebody to, to teach the Bible story this year. So uh, talk to Megan and would appreciate your help. She would appreciate knowing now so that she could plan the other things that need to go along with that. So, all right, that's it for the announcements I have this morning. Would you take this Connect card, please? And put your name and address on it, the phone number, email, and then also your prayer requests here, especially those that you want me to pray for um, on, on my retreat. And uh, turn them in then at the appointed time to this inside aisle. Well, I guess when you complete them, turn them in here to the inside aisle, and then we will collect them at that point. So Marty is going to come as you fill that out. Marty's going to come and... Um, He's going to lead us in our scripture reading this morning, and the scripture reading is Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 15, and if you are wanting to use the Bible that is in a chair in front of you, you can pick that Bible up, turn to page 160, and the passage will be found there on page 160, so Marty's coming. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so the place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the fourteenth day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither he replied, But as commander of the army of the Lord I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. All right, for our missions focus this morning, you can find information there in the bulletin on the upper right-hand side. Uh, we are, again, looking at requests from West Africa, and uh, s s they are ministering to refugees in the area, and so we're praying with them for that ministry, and then again for Delco Alliance Church near Columbus, actually Delaware, Ohio. And so I would invite you to bow with me, please, as we intercede. Father, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you that this is the Lord's day. It is the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And so we mark it as believers as a day of worship and as, as a 
uh, sign of the, the new creation that Jesus brought into order. And so we honor you, Lord Jesus, on this your day, and we thank you for your lordship, your sovereignty, your kingdom that has come and is continuing to come to this earth. And so, Lord, we would ask that in our prayers you would use them to that end, that the name of God would be hallowed in all the earth, that his will would be done everywhere, and so we pray. And we intercede for the spread of the gospel. We ask God for the gospel message to be clearly proclaimed and taught and demonstrated in various places, uh, and specifically today to, uh, to West Africa. We give you thanks for our Alliance workers who are there coordinating efforts with, among uh, displaced people. Thank you for the national church that, are, that is receiving refugees. Uh, for Christian schools that are receiving students. And Father, we pray that uh, as they open up their doors and provide food and clothing and uh, shelter, that you would use the national church and our international workers in order to bless those who are coming, to receive them from a, a very difficult situation and provide them with uh, basic uh, means that would then also give them hope for the future. We pray, Lord, that in this ministry of love that the Lord Jesus would be glorified and as our workers uh, meet these practical needs that they would have opportunities also to, to share for in, in the, the spiritual resources that Christ gives to us and that many would come to know Jesus because of this. We want to thank you for an opportunity in the women's ministry to teach Bible. We ask God that you would use this as a way to bring hope and salvation to those who are there and, and hearing. And we also ask for, um, well, we ask for the permission in the women's ministry uh, prison and also in the men's prison as well. And, and Lord, may you bless these efforts that are entered into in the strength and in the name of Jesus. For our friends in, in uh, Delaware, Ohio, for Jordan McCain and his, his family, the Andersons, uh, Brad Gee and his family, and, and those who are gathered there, we, we pray, God, for your continued direction for them and uh, give them access to people there who need Christ. And we pray that you would help them to, to discern their area, their, their region, and where they can focus their ministry that would be the most productive and father may you bless these leaders give them unity with the church and in the mission that you would be glorified there and that many people would come to christ and father as we are wanting to uh, reach our our neighborhood our community we we pray you would guide and direct us we we pray for our upcoming uh, easter egg hunt and and lord we pray that many families uh, who who perhaps haven't ever been here before might come and that the the uh, the message of the resurrection of jesus would be clearly taught to the children and to those who are with them we pray father that this would be uh, the beginning of opportunity with those families then to share with them the gospel of jesus father we also pray towards our uh, Easter uh, services and, and people who may come during that time as well. Lord, we also want to to conclude our prayer time this morning as, as we pray for uh, the world, as we pray for Ukraine. And Lord, um, Renee mentioned to me this morning, uh, Alliance workers there, the church is there, they are receiving people, they are ministering to people. And Father, we often from a distance look at this kind of a situation and not knowing how best to pray. Um, and so we pray for your will to be done. But Lord, there are your people uh, who, are, who are there, who are very close at hand. And so they understand what's occurring. And so Father, we ask that you would hear their prayers 
and you would answer them according to your riches and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are going to turn in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians, the letter of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 5. We're going to look at uh, the last couple of verses there. And um, again, if you are using one of our congregational Bibles, a Bible you can find in the chair in front of you on the shelf. There's hymnals, there's Bibles. Find one that says Holy Bible. Turn to page 868 in, in, that, um, in that Bible and you will find the passage here. It is a familiar passage, though uh, I guess, you know, it's, it's speaking of uh, walking in the Spirit. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the deeds of the flesh. And um, we usually focus on, on that part of this passage, but I, I want to look at the last uh, couple of verses there of, of chapter 5, and kind of a summary of, of the teachings there, but uh, Paul throws in these, these, a few instructions to us right there, and I and, uh, find it interesting and, and actually uh, very applicable Um, as we think about living the Christian life. So Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 through 26, and you can follow along as I read. Paul says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us Keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Would you bow with me, please, for a moment of prayer? Father, we thank you for this portion of Scripture written by the Apostle Paul, inspired by your Holy Spirit, preserved for us, inerrant through the centuries, that we might read and know the word of God and that you might use it then to speak into our lives. We would pray that your spirit would strengthen us in this moment, that you would enable our minds, our hearts, and our wills to join together with the purpose of obeying your voice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a pastor was ministering to a family, and he found himself taking a 45-minute drive in an old, beat-up van with a guy that he barely knew. Along the way, they ended up talking about Jesus and whether this man would admit his need for Christ and place his faith in him. This man's response to the pastor laid out humanity's resistance to the gospel with striking clarity. He said, my biggest problem is pride. I can't humble myself. And you want to know the reason I can't give up my pride? And he leaned onto the steering wheel and paused for effect. Because it's brought me so far. The pastor couldn't believe his ears. He knew that this man's pride had brought nothing but pain. It was all he held on to while growing up in gangs, while his father died of a drug overdose and his mother was in the mafia. He knew that this self-made man was violent towards his wife, that he was unemployed, that he had just gotten out of prison. In fact, the pastor found out a week later that this man was headed back to prison. 
And in a separate conversation, this man's wife said that his young daughters were terrified of him, that he was an alcoholic, that she was planning to leave him. She even told the pastor that that old van he was driving was about to be repossessed. Yet despite all of their differences, the pastor couldn't help but notice that in some ways he and that man were very similar. The pastor confessed, I struggle to lay down my pride because it's brought me so far, I think. What it's really brought both him and me, the pastor continued, is pain, isolation, and ruined relationships. Pride is one of those things that is easy to see in others, but it is hard to see in ourselves. Yet it is one of the most basic things that we all have in common as human beings. It may be the the very root of sin itself. In fact, the very first sin, that sin committed by Satan or Lucifer, was to exalt himself above the place as a created being, as one of the angels of God. He exalted himself, in his own eyes at least, to the place of God. And of course, he was cast out of heaven for this. It was also then to pride that Satan tempted the woman in the Garden of Eden. He said to her, for God knows that in the day you eat of that fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And with that, the man and the woman attempted to throw off the yoke of God and choose for themselves what would be good for them. You see, that is pride. The the ironic thing is that though humankind is a created finite being, it seems that our capacity for hubris is nearly infinite. Let me define hubris. Hubris is that excessive self-confidence or that arrogance which leads a person to believe that he or she may do no wrong. Paul, after contrasting the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit here in Galatians 5, summarizes the principles of the Christian life. He says, we have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, and we now live by the Spirit. That's a summary of his teaching right there. So he summarizes the principles of the Christian life, and then he warns the Galatians against the insidious sin of pride. You and I are never beyond the reach of this sin. You and I are never far from it. Paul uses three words for the way that pride injects itself into human relationships, and especially groups even into families, and even into the church. So let's look at these three words as a warning for us to avoid the sin of pride. You have your uh, outlines uh, that were included in the bulletin. You can follow along there as we work our way through these, the really one verse. Verse 26 is where we are focused this morning. But there we see that the first warning against pride that is given by Paul, we are to guard against being conceited. He uses the word conceited there. It's helpful to note that Paul's teaching on the sinful deeds of the flesh and then the life in the spirit which produced the fruit of the spirit is in the context of conflict within the church to whom he's writing. The instruction just before this section here on the fruit of the Spirit, the instruction that came just before that was to love your neighbor as you love yourself. For if you bite and devour one another, you will end up consuming one another. That's in verse 13 of chapter 5. So it's in that context that he launches into his teaching on the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And then following those well-known instructions... He concludes with this instruction 
uh, about guarding against pride. Now, the life of the Spirit is not given for our own personal piety, but so that we may love one another in the same manner as Christ has loved us. For this we need the power of the Holy Spirit. So following up this teaching, Paul says, do not be conceited. Some of you grew up with the King James Version of the Bible, that old English translation. It said, let us not be desirous of vain glory or empty glory. Another translation calls it boasting. And what Paul is talking about here is the puffing up of oneself, usually at the expense of another person or in relation to another person. The example from the Gospels that comes immediately to my mind is the brothers James and John. Their mother, in fact, speaks to Jesus on their behalf and asks that when he comes into his kingdom, that, they, that, that Jesus may place the two brothers, James and John, on his right and on his left. These would be the positions of chief authority under Jesus. We mentioned the word hubris before. It is an arrogance that is oblivious to its own self-seeking. That it's so oblivious, in fact, that it cannot see how prideful it really is. And in this instance with James and John, Jesus had just been teaching his disciples about his impending date with the cross, where he would give his life as a ransom for many on behalf of others there. James and John did not seem to hear that. They were looking out for their own self-interest and would not rest until they secured their places of honor. This is an example of seeking vain glory. The sad thing is they were not alone in that instance because it says the other ten disciples were indignant towards them. Why? Because they wanted to ask for the same positions. The disciples are a mirror into humanity. We all are capable of such vain glory. Conceit is puffing ourselves up in relation to others. It's having a wrong view of ourselves and a wrong view of those around us. We begin to view other people as a means to exalting ourselves. So this desire for vain glory that is behind conceit will taint everything we do. Even our service to others will not be truly humble if we are, if we are, uh, if we are conceited or seeking vain glory. Even our service to others will be a means to be seen by others and to be recognized as one who serves well. And when that is occurring, you see, then we are not doing this for the love of God. We are doing it for the praise of people. It is an empty glory. Its reward will be experienced here and not in heaven. Allow me to contrast this service motivated by conceit with that which is motivated by love and done for the good of others and ultimately for the glory of God. A veteran missionary who graduated from Cambridge University was at a mission station in Latin America. He had served the mission so, effect so effectively that the national church officials responsible for the mission asked him to become president of their seminary. He responded, oh, that's, that's no place for a gringo. A national leader ought to fill that position. Then they said, well, very well, we want you to be the academic dean. A person of your credentials is needed to fill that position. Again, the missionary said, oh, no, we have a national leader who can serve quite capably in that position. He must become the academic dean. Well, soon the mission leaders were... were Considering where the staff should be housed on the campus, they felt the missionary should be given the best house on the compound. And again, this missionary refused, and he said, well, that, that residence should belong to the, the president of the seminary. And so they wanted to give him the next best house, and so he made the case that the academic dean should have that one. 
And so finally, the mission officials, having no other choice, put the missionary and his family in the only remaining house that was there. It had no sink in the kitchen, so the family washed their dishes in the bathroom until one of the children came down with hepatitis. The students of the seminary visited uh, this missionary and his family, and they wept at what they saw. And they said, Deuteronomy says that when we have a stranger in our midst... We are responsible for his well-being. We must do better by you than this. So they found better housing for this missionary family. But as a result of this missionary's humble service to the people that he was serving, um, there were remarkable changes that began to occur in the national church in that area. It had once been badly divided but it began to come together. The attitude of the missionary who in humility considered others better than himself had a healing effect on the division in the church. They saw him and wanted to be more like him as he, as he imitated the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to counteract conceit is to look to Jesus and imitate his humility. And we can only do that in the strength of the Spirit, as Paul tells us in this passage. And so the Lord Jesus leads us away from vain glory and leads us towards the kind of life that brings glory to him. Well, there is a second warning in this verse about pride. Paul says we are to guard against provoking one, each other. We are to guard against provoking each other. Now, this is another way that pride manifests itself in our lives and in our interpersonal relationships. It occurs when we feel superior to others. When we feel superior to others. Its basic meaning is that of challenging another to a contest. It's the word that would be used of a bully on the playground who, who uh, goes to the younger children uh, children that, that he's much stronger than, larger than, and tries to pick a fight with them. He's challenging them to a contest. That's what this ver word is like. We challenge people in this way because we want to demonstrate our superiority, superiority to them and to others and then to ourselves as well. So we, we want ourselves to be lifted up, seen to be superior by ourselves, by others, and by those with whom we challenge. And so we find ways to cause them or others to recognize what we see as our own superiority. Now there are a number of ways that this prideful attitude may manifest itself. And so allow me just to provide one scenario today that, that uh, may help you to, to catch this and understand it. In this scenario, Let's say there is a coworker at your place of employment. Uh, maybe if you're at school, it would be a fellow student. But in, in this scenario, a coworker at your place of employment who doesn't seem to fit in with everyone else. It could be that they are just awkward socially. That happens. On top of that, he is not very good at the job. He makes frequent mistakes or poor decisions and is viewed as the weak link by his co-workers. Other co-workers see these frequent shortcomings and look down on that person. They talk about this one behind his back. They make jokes behind his back. Every mistake that this co-worker makes is, is then magnified because it is seen by others and it is passed around the office or the shop until his incompetence becomes legendary. He becomes the frequent topic of workplace gossip. Nearly everyone looks down on him and feels superior to him. Now, in this case, that which Paul calls provoking isn't done directly to the person's face, but it is done indirectly behind his back. But one's pride is still stroked because the feelings of superiority are fed, and there is recognition of this among the co-workers. So this attitude of provoking spreads among the other employees. And that's not so far-fetched, is it? I imagine every one of us who have ever been in a public job 
a school or some location, a team, know the kind of person I'm talking about and how the others begin to single them out and find ways to bring that person down so they themselves are exalted in their own eyes. Now, as a believer and one who is called to live by the Spirit, what do you do in that situation that would be keeping in step with the Spirit? We're called to live by the Spirit. Paul says we need to keep in step then with the Spirit of Christ. What does a believer do? First, you need to have some empathy for this person's predicament. It may be true that that coworker is socially awkward, that that person is quite annoying often to be around. It may be true that he makes a lot of mistakes and is the weak link at work, and other people at work hold him in contempt and gossip and backbite about that, that person. But why should you as a believer in Jesus take pleasure in that? Because this guy is in a very bad spot. To be the person who is on the outside among co-workers is a lonely place. Work can be difficult enough day in and day out on its own, right? But then to be ostracized by your co-workers... If that was you, you wouldn't want to go to work each day. Can you imagine the anxiety that begins to build as this man prepares himself to go to work each morning? So I repeat, why should you as a believer in Christ take pleasure in that? It is only your pride, your desire to feel superior, and yet it comes at another's expense that is provoking. This is out of step with the spirit and is more aligned with the sinful deeds of the flesh as described by Paul in those previous verses. So I have a suggestion. Pray. Pray for your coworker each day as you drive to work. Pray that things would go well for him that day, that he would be able to find good things to encourage him there. Pray for yourself that you would be a kind person to him and then be that kind person. Refuse to join in the gossip and the backbiting. Find legitimate reasons to speak well of him to others so that people can see the positive things that this person contributes as well as seeing his shortcomings. You take an interest in him, in his family, in his life outside of work. Ask yourself how you may be an encouragement to this man. For this would fulfill what Paul said in verse 13. Serve one another through love. Now that is in step with the Spirit of Christ. We must resist in the power of the Spirit this temptation to stoke our own pride by feeling superior to others. Well, there's a third warning that Paul gives in this verse. And he says we are to guard against envying each other. We are to guard against envying each other. This manifestation of pride differs from the previous one. It differs from provoking. Provoking and envying are not the same. Provoking comes from comparing yourself to another and feeling superior to them. Envying comes from feeling inferior to others. Pride leads us to seek vain glory, but if we feel inferior to a particular person in some way, we will resent that person and become envious of that person. And envy is a very powerful 
emotion, especially when it gets mixed with anger. It will color how we view that person, how we treat that person, how we receive what they do, whether they're able to do anything good in our eyes. It will be colored by the envy that we have. Now, if we think of even a few examples from the Bible, we can see how negative and how far-reaching envy can be almost immediately. In the very first book of the Bible, Cain. Cain was envious of his brother's acceptance with God. And Cain killed his brother. second generation of human beings and there we have murder of one's brother fratricide joseph think of joseph in the book of genesis joseph's brothers contemplated killing him but then just sold him into slavery why they were envious of the favor that was shown to him by their father king saul was envious of the fame of David. And he wound up chasing him through the wilderness in order to kill him. And then we come to the New Testament, and there we read of the religious leaders of first century Israel. Envy of Jesus' popularity with the people. And they begin to plot for his murder. Envy is a very powerful and destructive manifestation of pride. So envy, again, is about competing with someone. It has been defined as an incurable fear that others have it better than you. So envy is driven by fear, by feelings of insecurity and inferiority. You want to look better. You want to feel better. You want to live better. You want to be better than everyone else or at least that one person that you have so much trouble with. Envy is about wanting what other people have, but if you can't have it, you don't want them to have it either. Do you ever find yourself envious of another person? Perhaps, again, it's the coworker. Maybe it is a sibling. Maybe a friend could be a fellow Christian. Ask yourself why you're envious of that person. Could it be that somehow or in some way you feel inferior to them? So you compete with them in your mind and you want what they have. It may have nothing to do with material possessions. It may just be their particular gifts or their status among others, the esteem with which others hold them. You're, you're envious of that, or there, or there are a lot in life that you wish you had. There are lots of ways that we allow pride to twist our heart so that we view people as our competitor, and if we are feeling inferior to that person, we begin to envy them. And envy can dig up a lot of, a lot of bad, bad feelings and actions on our part. So I have a suggestion for how you may overcome envy. Again, it begins with prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit, right? You need to walk in step with the Spirit, so you ask the Holy Spirit to make you grateful for your place in life. Ask the Holy Spirit to make you grateful for the blessings that you have. Ask the Holy Spirit to make you grateful for the service that God has given you. You see, gratitude forces us to stop looking at what others have and instead to appreciate what God has given us. Instead of obsessing over how good that other person has it, we instead receive and enjoy whatever God has given to us. Instead of comparing whatever it is about the other person that makes us envious, we simply enjoy the blessings that God has given to us. 
instead of seeking to tear down another person, we see these blessings from God and we exalt Him and worship. Worship of God carries us away from envy of this other person. It is good to take time each day to thank God for his gifts. To remind yourself of how good God has been to you. It's good to bow your heads three times a day to thank God for your food before the meal. It's good to begin or end your quiet time with prayers of thanksgiving. It's good to keep a journal beside your bed or, or with you uh, in, your, in your purse or if you carry a, uh, carry a backpack Uh, something like that, to record and remember the good things and important things that God is doing in your life. Because when we remember how good God has been to us in the past, we find our contentment in Him in the present rather than in whatever it is that so-and-so has that I don't have. So when you become thankful for what God has given you and how God uses you for his glory and how God blesses your kids and how people encourage you, you discover gratitude brings you a whole lot more happiness than envy ever did. And you will discover that gratitude crowds envy right out of your heart. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't do that. But God can. So the manifestations of pride. Conceit. Provoking. Envying. These manifestations of pride can show up anywhere, any place there are people. They show up at work. They show up at school. They show up at church. They show up in the home. They may show up in you. But those who have crucified the flesh and walk by the Spirit are called to be agents of transformation. Transformation not just for their own personal lives, but for the people and the community that is around them. The fruit of the Spirit is to enrich the community, not just the individual believer. And it is in this way that you walk in step with the Spirit. He will guide you. Can we pray? Oh Lord, this morning we have been thinking not about someone else, but about me. Everyone sitting here. Thank you for your word, Lord, that is able to discern the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And Lord, without your grace, we would remain a mess. And ugly things like we talked about today would be the rule. But Jesus, you, you are the king. And we ask you to rule our lives with the kind of love and grace that you give to us that we might give to others. So Lord Jesus, May your kingdom come. Your will be done in me today, even as it is in heaven. Amen. Please stand and sing with us again.
Father, we have heard from your heart things that we're so prone to fall into, to be envious, since, Lord, um, in provoking one another. You want us to provoke one another to love. So, Father, continue to form in our hearts and in our lives the glory of your Son. May we see, even though through a glass darkly, that we're being shaped and formed into the image of your Son. Thank you for that which we've heard from you. We ask that it would bear fruit in our lives today and this coming week. We ask in the Master's name, amen. Amen.